Hello, and welcome to this NJCU Center for the Arts digital event. We would like to ask everyone to please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the program, and we will only be accepting questions and comments via the chat window. At the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer, or possibly the top right if you are on a different device, you should be able to see an option for chat. If you click that, it will open the chat window where you can type your questions so that they may be read aloud and answered. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Please note, the views and opinions expressed in this virtual event and presentation are solely those of the individual artists in their personal capacity and are not reflective of nor represent official policy, position, or views of New Jersey City University. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. My name is Stephanie Chaikin. I'm the director of the New Jersey City University Center for the Arts. And on behalf of my whole team here, I'd like to welcome you to the Wonder Women Artist Talk, Health and Art in a Global Pandemic. We have an amazing day today. Um, really privileged to have this group of artists with me. And I'm gonna start out with curator and artist, um, Doris Casualo, NJCU's Interim Associate Gallery Director. I'll tell you a little bit about her. She's an artist, an activist, a curator, and educator. Casualo has an MFA in Integrated Media Arts from Hunter College, and she's been teaching at Hunter College, Rutgers University, and New Jersey City University. She is co-founding director of GAIA, an artist collective working to help support women artists and the advocacy of women's issues established in 2002. And Doris has curated group artist exhibitions showcasing the work of over 400 artists. She's the founder and curator of the Wonder Women Residency Program, an annual group artist residency and exhibition. Her work also includes interactive sculpture, community-based performance, online digital installations, printmaking, ceramic, and fiber arts. So welcome, Doris, if you can start us off and tell us about the day. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm so excited to be here uh, and thank everyone for being here with us today. So I wanted to just take a, a, mo a moment to introduce the structure of the talk. Um, we're gonna have two artist presentations. Myself and Christine De Cruz will be uh, presenting. And then we'll have a kind of a, a little intermission of sorts. We'll have a Q&A session for about 15 minutes. And then we'll continue on. Polly Barden will present and Sharon De La Cruz will close out presentations with a second Q&A. So we'll, we'll kind of split the presentations up a bit so that we can take some questions in between. So feel free to put questions, comments, you know, shouts in the chat and we'll be fielding the chat for the Q&A. So you can throw uh, questions into there at any time during our presentations. Comments, of course, are also welcome. And then we'll kind of scroll through for questions during Q&A for both Q&As. So feel free to make that chat quite lively. And if you would prefer to have uh, a comment, uh, you know, give a comment and have your microphone turned on, make that request in the chat if possible. And we will, um, during the Q&A, have you unmuted uh, so that you can you know, uh, tell your comment. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll read your question. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Hi. Um, this is uh, my name, Doris Casoilo, and my social media handle, if anybody wants to reach out to me that way. Um, Anna, you can go ahead and get started, thank you. Okay, so I wanted to begin by introducing the Wonder Woman Residency Project first. Um, this is the 12th iteration of the project uh, and it is a project I've been involved in, you know, for all of those iterations. And so it is part of my art practice as well. 
um, the idea of creating community or community building as art practice is at the center of what I feel like is important about my work. In addition to making objects, I also believe that creating experiences uh, is, is important to, to what I'm exploring. And so the residency itself feels like, uh, like, my, like my work. Um, and this year, for the very first time, I participated as an artist uh, and not just a curator and organizer. And so this was a, a unique experience for many reasons. It was also the first time that the residency was online. Uh, usually the residency is begins with a theme. I, I invite a co-curator. We select 10 artists from an open call from proposals, projects that are not yet built, but are going to be built throughout the, the residency. And so this time it was a bit more of an invitation process. And um, of course it was, it was remote because we were all in isolation, which was also the reason we selected health as the theme. We were all hyper aware of the global pandemic, one of health, but how health was at the center of all of these other things that were coming up for us. And as we went through the residency, you know, in this theme of health, we also recognized that the residency itself was part of that process, not only exploring our health journeys, but using the collective as therapy. Uh, and that became very important. Our personal narratives, which we were sharing with each other, became really the information of the projects themselves. Next. For my own proposal, the first one I've, I've submitted or, or sort of began the residency with, I wanted to explore autoimmune disease, uh, something that I have been struggling with and I'm still learning about within my own body and in my life. But also I wanted to think about the objects that I made and how they would live in a gallery. Um, and I, wanted, I knew immediately that I wanted to focus on ceramic and fiber materials that I've been working with uh, in the past, but that I wanted to incorporate for this particular project and ceramic, a material I'm newer to and uh, fiber is something that I've been working with in a, for a long time and, and incorporating the two. Next. So I wanted to make objects, my idea was to make objects that would heal the wearer during trauma. And because we felt like we were inside of this kind of traumatic isolation uh, this this really uh, in, enormous amount of stress that felt very invisible. I wanted to think about visible things or symbols and icons and, and the sort of iconography of protection or healing. And I had stumbled upon uh, a Sheila Nagig sculpture that was actually a contemporary sculpture that someone had made and so I, I dove into these Sheila gigs. They immediately spoke to me as feminist objects, feminist images. And they're medieval sort of grotesque sculptures. They're called grotesques. You know, they're sort of on the top of European churches, mostly in Ireland and in the Iberian Peninsula, which also spoke to my culture, my heritage as a Portuguese American woman and a Catholic, which I realize informs much more of my work than I imagined, sort of subconsciously growing up uh, a Catholic student, student in a Catholic school, et cetera. And so I realized that creeps in uh, consciously and subconsciously. And so I wasn't surprised I was drawn to these uh, sculptures. Um, and so I also realized that artists that were my personal heroes had been looking at the Sheila Nagig in the past, Nancy Spiro, one of them, you see, uh, her drawing there on the right, and many others. And, and the process of looking at, you know, sort of historical objects or the things that inform the work, th that was part of the meetings as well. The meetings would kind of drive us forward. And it was also a sharing process. So this was my week five update where we would come together and share with each other sort of where we were in the research process, in the technical process, and, and in the making, and we would share objects even though we were remote, we were quite able to, to do that. Next. 
so I wanted to think about a contemporary Sheila. So, you know, these Sheilas that are now, you know, 700, 800, some of them, uh, you know, almost a thousand years old. How do we look at these objects that maybe have less in common with us and imagine something new from them? And I really was excited to do that. So I thought about a contemporary Sheila and a contemporary Sheila that was informed by my own experience of power, uh, my experience of being inside of, of, a, of a body during a global pandemic, a female body, a body that was struggling with certain limitations, both internal and external, and also uh, a body that maybe needed healing. And so I wanted to create a contemporary idol that could heal and repair a feminist object that would take up space, but would also symbolize a sort of like a spiritual, emotional, and even physical healing. Next. So I played with scale. I wanted her to be, to again, to take up a, a, an amount of space in the room um, to, you know, command a certain amount of attention, but also still to feel delicate and soft in some way. So I wanted to play with this idea of strength and vulnerability. And I chose this, um, this uh, two-headed figure for, for her to, to kind of confront us head on, but also uh, to be looking in two directions at the same time. She represents for me a a duality. Uh, I'm a Gemini and I, I feel strongly that I want to see two sides. I want to imagine um, that there are more than one way of resolving things, but also I feel conflicted often and I feel sometimes in crisis and indecisive. And I wanted to have uh, a bit of that duality in the sculpture. And I began with that. Uh, and then I also wanted this duality of power and fear and these things that we were working with in the pandemic uh, to be represented in the sculpture. And so as we go down through the sculpture, uh, we see that she's held, her body is this tomato cage. And I had been uh, quite fascinated by plants and planting and growing things during the pandemic as many people were sort of a phenomenon. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to incorporate that sort of obsession into her body and I chose this cactus. Uh, it's a found, it was a cactus that I rescued from an abandoned greenhouse here in New Jersey. And the experience of, of coming upon this cactus was really special and important to me. And I knew immediately that it was her body. And the cactus of course itself uh, needs very little from the outside world, um, but also is quite vulnerable. Uh, soft inside, even though it's quite aggressive and prickly on the outside. It has that duality I was looking for. And then inside of the plant, I put a ceramic sculpture of a vulva. And that was important, of course, because of the, um, because of the Sheila and how prominent the vulva is in the Sheila images, but also in my own body and how some of these autoimmune issues have, have come up for me. Next. The thyroid uh, is a symbol that recurs quite a, a lot in this uh, project because the thyroid has been um, really the main focus or, or point of uh, a lot of autoimmune disease for me. In particular, eight years ago, I was diagnosed with, a, uh, with Graves' disease, a hyperthyroid. And that has, it's an, an, an endocrine issue. It has sort of systemic um, consequences or, or effects uh, that I'm still dealing with, but uh, feel I've learned so much and feel really uh, sort of that I've that I've understood it. And the thyroid has become kind of the symbol of perseverance, perhaps. Um, and also uh, the thyroid, uh, because it's hyper, there's multiple thyroids. There's many thyroids. It, it sort of has taken over so much about my life, um, but it's also connected back to uh, the head, the, uh, the, the headphones that you saw before that were uh, crocheted in uh, speaks to this kind of outside connection. She's at once 
closed off from the outside world, but also receiving information. Um, but if you see the information she's receiving is from the thyroids themselves, they're kind of tied back up. Uh, and so the thyroid is controlling in many ways. Uh, so it's, she's in control of the thyroid, the thyroid's in control of her. Um, next. And so I wanted to create a, an exhibition, for the exhibition, I also wanted to create a, um, a kit, uh, a health kit. I wanted to think about objects that could be used in ritual along with uh, sort of Sheila as a presence. I wanted there to be um, wearable pieces. Uh, and so uh, if you see here on the right, on the wall and on the right, you'll see the how the pieces um, are are sort of housed in this this kit, this box. Uh, and so next, here you can see how uh, all of these wearable pieces, largely for the hands, because uh, when I was diagnosed. Um, with the Graves disease, I had already been struggling with rheumatoid arthritis, which affects mostly the joints in my hands, in particular, uh, my index finger, my thumb, and my wrists. And so I knew I wanted to create objects that would quite literally heal those parts, but also maybe mimic some of the limitations I had in those parts of my body. Uh, and so there's a lot of emphasis on things that can be worn by the hands, but of course our hands as artists especially are so important in what we express and how we make things, especially in, in the ceramics process. And so I knew I wanted to focus on the hands. Uh, and then I also made a piece that is for the chest, which you see sort of hidden under in that larger drawer, a chest plate, um, which extends uh, from, from the neck. Um, next. Here we have one piece that is two minutes left. Oh, thank you. I, these are quick. Um, okay, so in the first piece, we have, oh my goodness, where am I? Uh oh, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, okay, so in the first piece, we have. Uh, our, uh, these eyes, I wanted to create uh, instructions for the pieces. So the instructions for the piece at the top left uh, is place these over the eyes to heal emotional wounds and dream. So the idea, of course, is that you can shut things out uh, and, and dream about something else. Uh, because we were alone, it felt pertinent to be able to shut out things. The second piece that you can see worn in the image there is place over the thumb and index finger, hold hand up and pray, right? So this idea of imagining, dreaming, hoping, uh, it, it reminded me of some of the sort of gestures of ceremony in church. Uh, I do not pray, I'm quite secular, uh, but during the pandemic, it felt this connection. And so next. Okay, sorry. Place over thumb and fingers of the right hand. Give permission to self for descent. And these are casts of my own fingers. And I thought when one feels the pressure not to speak, you need permission from yourself. And I thought these kind of really tough brass knuckles could maybe give you courage. Next. Place index finger and thumb into slots. Preach your truth. Tell your story. Next.
place on middle finger of dominant hand, reimagine balance. And the piece on the right is uh, uh, inspired by uh, a cactus. I have several pieces of cactus uh, made out of ceramic and this one wraps around the finger. The instruction is place on the pinky finger of the dominant hand, draw or write with a new perspective. Next. And this is the last piece and happens to be a selfie. Um, it's thyroid collar. I wanted to create a collar um, inspired by a lead collar that can be worn um, to protect the thyroid from radiation when taking an x-ray. I was fascinated by these lead collars, these kind of protective devices. And I wanted to create a ceramic version of that collar. Uh, and so uh, it's a collar that can be worn to prevent the thyroid from being removed. Uh, and so I wanted the, the thyroid to heal while you while you wore this kind of protective armor, this very literal protective hard armor around your neck. Um, for me, it's been a journey, uh, you know, with my thyroid, my thyroid has caused uh, many things, uh, including uh, my first son to be born prematurely. And so it, it has dictated so much, uh, but one of the, uh, I think important relationships that I have is that my thyroid is still intact. Uh, and I, it's been become it's been very important for me to keep my hyperthyroid, and so that has meant healing it without cutting it out. And that's why there's a sort of a hole in the collar there. There's still this vulnerability, uh, which is the last piece uh, in the exhibition, and also sort of where I am in my own exploration. I want to continue uh, to create work with this narrative of my relationship to my to my body um, and I, I, I do hope to to continue to making making these ceramic uh, organs and and wearable pieces. Next. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Um, I will be introducing our next speaker. Again, just a reminder to put any questions that you have in the chat, and we'll be reading them in the Q&A. Okay. Okay, Christine DeCruz graduated with a BFA from NJCU. So shouts to the alum in the audience. Um, as a multidisciplinary artist, her work is meant to reflect our ever-changing lives over our human collective experience. She focuses on photography and embroidery. In this FEMI series that she created for the residency project, um, it is a reflection on language, healing, being vulnerable, and it centers her identity as a woman, a daughter, and a caregiver. Christine has, oh my goodness. So Christine has done the residency four times. This is her fourth um, time doing the residency. And uh, I'll have Christine go ahead and get started. Hi, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is bound to be an emotional ride, so I really appreciate you all joining us. Um, this first image is an important milestone in using myself as a subject. I had been researching Portuguese women in the arts and was trying to understand my place and how to use my perspective and apply that to my work. One artist that really resonated with me was uh, Elena Almeida. She combined painting and photography in a way that made both disciplines equally important to the viewer within the same frame. I observed her rules and applied my own. The first was to start with black and white photography. 
The second was to employ a friend for this. I'm sorry. The second was to employ a friend. Um, and for this portrait, it was my friend, personal art director, Marilyn Arias, also an NJCU alum. Reaching out to community is a common thread throughout my life. So this rule was an easy one to follow. The third was to add color. Uh, in this image, the intention was to uh, imitate Almeida's style only using my own medium, um, in this case, blue thread. All Almeida's gestures were symbolic, and this was the framework for how I approached this project. Um, what I made for Wonder Women 12 residency um, is called Femi. Next. Who are we but a collection of stories that someone told us about ourselves? My father told me I was an artist long before I identified as one. My mother told me I was a dreamer, a daydreamer. Both these things are true and explain how I came to be where I am, who I am and how I show up. Three years ago, my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer and passed away within the year. After his funeral, I learned that I was unwell also. Um, when I was in my early teens, my doctor warned me that I had fibroids. Many girls do, she said. She handed me this prescription for birth control and explained that this was the only solution to keep the fibroids from growing. Only there were two problems with that. My mother was extremely religious and didn't approve of using birth control. And second, birth control was expensive. Three years ago, I learned I was anemic. So fast forward to three years ago, <laughs> I learned I was severely anemic and needed an urgent blood transfusion, followed by an urgent surgery to remove the fibroids that were causing so much havoc in my body. The surgery created this scar. Two things were true. I was severely depressed after the death of my father and I was severely sick and needed to pay attention to my body. This is a study of what my body looks like after surgery. I had to tell myself to be okay with it because the scar tells a story too. Next. I am a woman, a daughter, and a caregiver. The last few years I've spent in the service of my parents. Every relationship I have ever had has been affected by the decision to be available for them. This availability came with a price. Caring for others oftentimes leaves no room to care for yourself. I held on to these x-rays for three years before understanding how I wanted to use them. The study from the previous slide seemed like it made the most sense to me. I wanted to show the outside and the inside of my body and make them of equal importance. The text in this case reads F-E-M-I-N-I-N-O, feminino. My body blocks most of the lower letters, leaving only no legible. The x-ray up close has many visible fingerprints. This was intentional. Normally I wear gloves when handling transparencies in paper. In this case, it seemed appropriate to show all the times my body had been examined. My personal photographs of the unwelcome fibroids that made a home in my uterus. Next. The choice of using the words femi and local are important because they are easily translatable in both English and Portuguese. Being fluent in both languages made reading comprehension challenging for me. It has been helpful to find the similarities in the languages. It helps me to feel connected to both identities. Same, same, a little different. I have been in this transient space for the last few years, not sure where home is. My time has been completely split between two countries. This makes relationships challenging. This makes the notion of belonging challenging. I've had to lean into breaking my routine and finding a new rhythm, rhythm within this new landscape. Resisting all of it has been the most painful part. I was mindful this time around caring for my mother who like my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I had to be present for her. I understood my calling. When I was a kid going to Catholic school, I used to think that meant um, becoming a priest or maybe a nun. I committed to my mom to be there for her. And I committed to making this series, which was what I did for me. And in a sense, I was keeping it familiar. <laughs> familiar is another word that is spelled and means exactly the same in both Portuguese and English. Next. This series is exploring the transformation that happened and is happening when my body and my spirit are in alignment. The treatment on this snail study inspired the directional changes and how I approach the line work in the next set of images. The line starts to feel vibrational and it's that kind of intentional energy that I want to project. I decided to use animals that were local to both the US and Portugal. Working through this image helped me imagine what the photograph could be 
like using the rules I mentioned earlier. This was an opportunity to use a photograph of me, my body. And again, it felt appropriate to lean on a friend and photographer, Corina Casuelu, to realize this project. Next. The snail teaches us the importance of being mobile. The snail signifies patience in life. No matter how slow, I will get to my destination. If you know me, you know how funny that is because I'm very slow. <laughs> um, I learned I have always done things at my own pace and mostly because I have wanted to. The spiral represents evolution and growth of spirit. Living between Portugal and the US over the last few years has challenged my notion of what it means to be home. The last year offered me a new perspective on what home means and what that looks like. It doesn't matter where I land. I have concluded that like the snail, I am my own home. Next. The animals in this series represent the path I am on as I deepen my personal connection to my spirit. The spider is a weaver and is believed to connect the past and the future. The spider weaves these intricate, delicate patterns and that collect whatever come near. I feel like I am a collector of people. My web is for reaching. My, excuse me, my web is far reaching from Europe to North America. Having this kind of perspective, understanding who I could lean on has helped me navigate this new bicoastal life. I have used all of my resources to meet challenges I never thought myself capable. All of the photographs in this series illustrate a setting sun. Even this one, only it appears as a tiny, tiny crown on my head. Heavy is the head that wears, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Next. Animals survive by their intuition, and within this series, they are symbols of life, death, and rebirth. At some point in their lives, crabs dump one shell in exchange for another, symbolizing a point of rebirth in their life cycle. I feel like the transition for me started when I was caring for my father, but it wasn't until after the loss of my mother that I felt the loss of who I used to be. It was in this image that I started to notice there is a consistent framing around my hands that feels really important. So much of who I am is in what I make with my hands. Next. The flamingo can represent our social nature and desire to create community. Um, the residency is a nice example of community and shared space for healing interactions. The flamingo spirit reminds us to seek out the things that feed our souls and bring us joy. When I first printed this photo, I didn't have a notion of what, the, what it could be. It wasn't until I saw them, the flamingos, that, I, that it occurred to me. The flamingo is found in Portugal and in the US. Only in Portugal, they are mostly white because of the lack of shrimp in their diets. Shellfish are what gives flamingos their color. I guess like most things, the shrimp are in short supply there. <laughs> As for me, I was over my Portuguese diet after the first few months and was ready for my US return, my personal American food tour. Next. The seagull was the first of this series. Um, their presence is confirmation that we are indeed taking positive steps toward our soul's purpose. The seagull is a reminder that we are breaking through something. I placed myself in the unique position of being present and available for my parents while they transitioned into the spirit world. Birds in general hold a special place for me because they remind me of home. I hadn't wanted to share this work with my mother. I thought she would think it was silly or maybe even embarrassed. I was just telling myself this story that wasn't true. I needed an outside perspective to tell me that, to reassure me of that, to trust that my mom would see the work that I put in. And she did. I started with this one, the seagull. She thought they were all beautiful. She wanted to show everybody that came through the house what I was working on. So really that was my first show. Next. This is the last of the series and the only one hand stitched after I returned to the US. The perseverance of the eel reminds us that we have the power to manifest our desires, heal ourselves and create new realities. The eel's adaptability to new surroundings resonates with me at this time because of the challenges I have faced in trying to settle back into some semblance of my old life. I wanted to show a different angle of the picture to highlight the thread work. This palette was challenging because the dominant colors are dark. 
next. Trial and error. This is the back of that same piece. The eel went through its own transformation within this landscape. The original orientation of the eel didn't feel quite right. The, um, it was coiled around the front of my body, just following the safety of the curves. It was small in scale, as, especially compared to the other animals in this series. I opted in for a friendly critique when I decided I was done. The show was in a few days and this was the last piece to be installed. As was the theme for me this last year, I had to start over. Next. This entire series is about understanding multiple perspectives. The eel became symbolic of that understanding. It made sense to me to change course and position the eel in an outward forward kind of motion. It's always been about moving forward. Next. That does not mean we shouldn't sometimes check in with how we started and the lessons we pick up along the way. Lessons I have learned about myself. I am strong and I can and will do what I set out to do. To do the important work of being intentional in my relationships with people, with my art and with the food I eat. This connection to all things is relevant to my overall well-being. Next. I am grateful to Corina who made taking these pictures so effortless and to this residency for offering me the space to share and heal. Thank you, obrigada. Um, we will open up a 15 minute Q&A now so Doris and I can answer your questions. And I made it through without crying. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so I, I, there's a question about a recording. Um, and I do believe there will be a recording available on the NJCU galleries page. Uh, usually it gets put up on the exhibition page. And so check back. It does take a little bit of time for it to be approved. Hopefully it'll be up soon. Um, but you can check back onto that page or reach out to us um, within a few days uh, for the recording. There's also a comment from Ms. Lopez who says um, about the Sheila Gemini deals with communication and knowledge and is ruled by Mercury. And the Sheila is finished with a beautiful metallic finish on the head where so much communication happens. Thank you for sharing your vulnerabilities and inspire us to do big things even in the face of disease. Thank you. Um, I didn't talk about the metallic glaze, but it's really important to me. Um, so thank you for connecting to that and sharing your perspective about the glaze. I do appreciate that it is mirror-like um, and so that you can see yourself reflected in in the Sheila. Um, Eileen Ferraris, Ferraris says, love seeing you wear the pieces in the exhibit. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that the exhibition will be in the Visual Arts Gallery until December 10th. Uh, we'll remind everyone at the end, but a quick note that uh, gallery hours are Monday to Friday um, from 11 to five. And this weekend, tomorrow and Sunday, uh, we'll be holding special gallery hours from 12 to six. Um, if you wanna take note, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, there's still some opportunity. We're also having an artist reception this Thursday as part of, a closing, as part of the closing. So if you haven't seen the show, you know, take note that there are several opportunities to come by and see it um, before it closes on December 10th. Um, Christy Lopez also says, I love the snail. Oh, there's a question here. Question for Christine, also from Avni. Yeah. Uh, th is this series finished? No, as in all of my series, they never come to an end. They're always, no, I, um, I had intended to take another set of images when I was in Portugal with Corina. Um, and in this time, instead of it being, uh, in like this like earthy kind of landscape. I, my intention was to make it near the ocean. 
um, to be more inclusive of like water animals too. I felt like there was, there was definitely something important about water and ritual. So I kind of wanted to incorporate that. So that might be, you know, part two of, of this evolution of this project, which I'm still interested in exploring. Polly, Polly said the color transition and the crab representation is amazing. She's in awe. Thank you, Polly. Lisa Ficarelli Halpern says these pieces are exquisite. I love the smaller scale. Um, yeah, scale is important on those. They're quite they're eight by ten. Chris, are they? Uh, which ones? The 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 postcard ones are like five, like four by six. And it was important to keep them small because I was trying to work fast to work out the ideas for this project, which my intention was to make them bigger. And so, oh, also these, all of these that I showed you are, are just the studies. I, my, I, I printed larger versions to recreate the animals and on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, with that, I always end up changing what they look like. So um, it never looks the same. <laughs> Uh, Yvonne Duck says, I love the stitching, feels reminiscent of the, sew of the sewing yourself back together and healing. Yeah, there's um, a lot of that. Beautiful work, Marianne Petit. Uh, can you talk about, oh, Sharon De La Cruz asks, can you talk about the consideration in how many people interact with your pieces? Is that for me or for Doris? That's Doris. For both, basically for both. the consideration for interactivity or not in the pieces. Mm, good. Yeah, that's a Sharon question, isn't it? Um, I am still working out who the pieces are for. I realized in my descriptions today, even of instruction, am I instructing others or am I instructing me in the use of the kit? So I think I'm still working out the instruction interaction uh, expectations. I almost want to see what happens, how people approach them and kind of gauge. But um, I do imagine that these could be worn by others. I think they were made for me. So it's still feeling very personal. Um, even though the intention, I think, was to make them interactive, they still feel like mine. Um, so maybe it's another iteration that has to be uh, made with that intention of, of giving them away or, or of allowing others to wear them. Um, but the instructions feel like a step in that direction. So that is the intention that they will be very literally interactive. Right now they're kind of limited in their interaction, but I do want the audience, I think, to see them. They're on display. I want them to be seen and imagined in ritual. And so, um, yeah, I think they'll be part of performances um, and and eventually they'll be, you know, interactive in the gallery. I think that's the intention, yeah. Um, for me, it's interesting because the process of making this was um, felt like I was just so anxious throughout this whole process because the idea of being nude in front of people, for being nude in public, I mean, I am wearing a dress, but I'm basically naked. Um, and then to be photographed in this way, because I'm usually the one holding the camera. So like the awkwardness of just being the model for once and then trying to imagine what an animal would look like. <laughs> um, it stitched over me and like, so what my body needed to look like so that I can make these pieces. Um, I had worked out early on that I was doing a seagull so I kind of knew what I was gonna look like for the photo. I'd worked out that I was gonna be a snail. I'd worked out that photo. And then kind of just let Karina um, kind of instinctually take her own photographs, which I was so glad that I was, um, I was happy to trust her um, because the landscape was such an important part of the whole photograph for me. Um, so back to the question, like, to even show them in social media was <laughs> intense. But once I got over that, and then I think the hardest part was showing them to my mom. And once I did that and she was okay with it, then it didn't really matter who else saw them. So now I'm like, totally fine. That, oh, and then showing them in the gallery and like I had graduated from NJCU. So that became, it just all felt really strange because I, I consider myself kind of a private person in that way. Um, but 
yeah, I'm totally over all of those insecurities. And now I'm even considering making NFTs out of these. So there's that. Um, so yeah, now it's about public view for everybody, I guess. Um, another question from Polly Barden. Was there a piece that you struggled for, for Doris, for me? Was there a piece that you struggled to connect with? And uh, Christine speaking about just struggling, I think my work has always been driven by a personal narrative. I, I think it's it's hard to make work that's not driven by sort of some kind of personal narrative, but these projects, I think, really dove into your physical body and not just your politics or your beliefs in a way that felt, made me feel more vulnerable. And I think, you know, Christine's speaking about that sort of vulnerability of the image of her very literally, these are not images of me, but I felt very vulnerable exploring health because health feels personal and sometimes taboo. And we we suppress it and we smush it down and we don't talk about it. We don't talk about what ails us usually, or if we do, it's inconvenient for others, you know, to, to sort of listen. And this residency centered the conversation about things that might be quote unquote broken. Uh, whether it's inside of our body or the way our bodies are perceived. And so that just felt vulnerable because ugh, the whole setup is that health feels like vulnerability. And how do you flip it and make it feel like strength? How do you take something that is supposed to be wrong and make it feel like this is what makes you stronger? And that was really healthy, I think, um, but feels counter to what we're taught to feel about health. And so I thought that was maybe the most important struggle for me was how do you take something that feels like it's wrong and make it what's cool about you or what is making the work awesome, right? Like, hey, I have a broken thyroid, but that's why I'm making all of these really beautiful thyroids with Raku and, you know, kind of getting these results, like this thing that's supposed to be the broken thing becomes this beautiful object. And that was, I think, a process that that worked, thankfully. Um, I think there was one more question. Oh, fashion, Doris, that brings fashion to mind, high fashion versus streetwear. Uh, yeah, I, I, my work is usually not serious. There's a lot of toys inspire my work and there is definitely a playful element. Um, you know, the kit for healing is a little tongue in cheek, right? How can it heal you? Uh, also, I'm obsessed with accessories. And so it made sense that I would make a, a kind of party kit. The, the piece, which I didn't mention somehow, is called Made for a Party. The series is called Made for a Party. And it's Sheila and a gig. Uh, and objects for healing broken parts. But the whole series is called Made for a Party. So I Absolutely, I'm, I'm getting ready for this party. I think there's uh, a question from Polly for me. Okay, I was just reading. Um, how did being in the US made the creation of the eel different than the others that in Portugal? Um, I guess it was different because it was, um, it was done so far after, it, 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 there was so much time that had passed between the spider, which was the last one that I had done in Portugal. And um, actually that's not true, I'm sorry, it wasn't the spider, it was the flamingo. The flamingo was the last one I did in Portugal. Um, and the eel, like so much had happened in that time that I was like, not even sure that I was gonna end up uh, making it, but I had set out like I was gonna make nine pieces. And so I was it, it, through hell or high water, even if it was up until the last minute, I was gonna try to do it. And so I worked out the original illustration and it was working, but um, I knew that the, the scale was off and I knew the direction of the eel was off, but I needed like the extra um, advice uh, or critique to, to let me know that I, that I needed to, to start over. Um, and at this point, like, since I was already letting myself do whatever I was feeling for this project, like I kind of wasn't sticking to any rules about that, like whatever I felt like I was in, in the mood to do, that's kind of what I did. Um, and I kind of applied that same um, attitude to, to the eel, which I think, 
in the end really worked out to close out the whole series because you know the idea was for it to move forward um and and yeah i think metaphorically it worked and i think that was it for questions janet says i feel enormously inspired to make work after seeing and listening to you both <laughs> illness can turn whew, thank you um illness can turn away to can turn one away from the optimism of making arts exactly so finding strength and motivation there in that distress is wonderful to see jen that's amazing thank you for that comment that feels like extra power <laughs> and sending you all the energy holy relics yeah, that Catholicism is creeping in, Gwen. We're traumatized by all of it. <laughs> yeah, or informed at the least, right? Without judgment. Um, special boxes, churches, and relics, right? Yeah, the box is definitely part of the ritual, I think. Thank you, Gwen. Um, okay, I think, I think, should we? I just want to say one more, th one more thing really quickly. I think one of the things that was really powerful about this residency, even in like, even in our interaction now with this artist talk is having these conversations that we, we are uncomfortable having about our health and just about where we are in our lives. And it's been so nice to be able to share that and normalize that, you know, cause everybody's kind of going through it. So um, that, that's been a really important part. Yeah. We have to normalize conversations about health, and of and of course, the residency is also uh, focusing on gender and how those conversations about health, in particular for women, um, become even more complex because healthcare in general centers men so much that um, it becomes an extra obstacle um, for you know, humans experiencing the world in, in female bodies uh, to feel, you know, invisible or to feel uh, misunderstood. Um, and so gender and race and, and class and so many things came up for us too. And in these personal journeys, the, the bigger picture of why we feel this vulnerable about health, why isn't health something that is more centered uh, and so, all of that. All right. Well, I think uh, we're going to go on to Polly. Uh, maybe Christine oh. will be introducing Polly. I forgot I still had a job to do. <laughs> One more. <laughs> One more thing. Um, our Dr. Polly is a mixed media artist whose work focuses on social issues and is showcased in venues around the globe. Her project, Emotional Sorting Cape, is her most vulnerable piece where she explored making the invisible tangible. Take it away, Polly. <laughs> so, um, hi, Polly. Um, this, I think this is my third time in the Wonder Woman residency. And um, if, you know, where I would like to start is I wanna take everyone back to 2008, uh, New York City, Western, west of the Iron Flatiron District, and my friend uh, Mary Jays and I were meeting for lunch, and we go into this restaurant and we order and we sit down, and literally, <laughs> not even five minutes, they tell us that they're closing, and so we get our you know takeout containers and we're kind of inquiring like why didn't you say anything when we came in. And we go back out in the rain and we get to the corner, we're standing in our umbrellas and Mary Jays goes, we're just gonna stand here and be angry. And for me, that was like, what? Like you can just like decide you're gonna embrace. <laughs> Cause my whole, you know, I'm a fixer. I'm always wanting to solve the problem. And um, as Doris was alluding to like being a female, I've always worked in male dominant environments. So you know, always not, you know, kind of not being the emotional woman was something. And in the 10 plus years since then, that is something I've reflected on or has come up in my memory quite a bit. 
and um, uh, so this just you know this you know this permission you could give yourself to just sit with anger was just like in, amazing to me because um, I've worked most of my life to not deal with any internal emotions. So then we cut forward to 2020 and you know, all the things I usually use to um, fill my life, keep me busy so I don't um, engage with myself, my work, uh, my art, my you know, friends and, and volunteer projects get all get stripped away. And, um, you know, and I, you know, am in this place where it's just me and my thoughts <laughs> and, you know, realizing I have no tools to, to deal with this. Um, so, um, I, uh, the one, I think some, one of the nice things that have come out of the horrors of the pandemic is it has shrank the globe. We are more connected and able to, um, you know, reach across boundaries and borders. And one of the ways I was able to do that was um, first I found a uh, um, online meditation group. And what attracted me to it uh, was the people who run it um, were, they're just as open about the things they're struggling with. There, so there wasn't like this sense of I'm a serene <laughs> Zen master. You know, they're like, you know, like the, there's a couple in the, the male from the beginning was like, at the beginning, I thought this was BS. <laughs> and it's a global, you know, our core community is a global community. And so talking about normalizing, the sense of not feeling like, not having a sense of feeling this is being concept and other people expressing that. Alongside that, I found an online therapist, well, a therapist, and we connect over line, who works in mindfulness and meditation. So anyone who's been, been in these realms would know that um, these items, um, br the breath is one of the, the core basis. The other thing is a lot of times when working in mindfulness and talking about emotions is about visualizing them and giving them colors. And so that, you know, the researcher part of me, um, you know, because once again, the, the sense of emotions was so uh, foreign. And that was also something that was hard for me to acknowledge about myself that, yeah, I knew these words, but it really, it's kind of like someone who's colorblind. Like you, you hear people talk about red, green, and blue, and you know, you may have been, you're based in the way you see the world, you may know something that's red, but in theory, you're not seeing the red that color, color people who can see color see. And as I was exploring, so that's what led me to this wheel of emotions. And, you know, also, I realized like, yeah, I was really was like a, a kid in, in kindergarten where you first are kind of learning red, green, blue. And here I'm like, well, I'm used to happy, sad, angry, but not really thinking about all the ranges. And also realizing, you know, I'm not, you know, it's not a binary experience. There's always multiple things going on. And, you know, um, so as I was working through, okay, well, now I have like a visual aspect, but when I'm sitting and working through, you know, when I'm sitting and, and trying to embrace and work through my emotions, I'm already trying to focus on the interior, which I've historically avoided. And then also, um, then also trying to conjure up this image. So that's what led me to, okay, I want to create something physical and tangible I can work with. I'm a, um, you know, my two learning straights are visual and kinesthetic. And that's what led to the cape. So the, the cape was important because when I was in high school, I wanted a cape. Um, and it was not in style at all. You couldn't find it anywhere. So I 
my mom found a seamstress and a pattern and had a cape made. And I you know, wore that in high school and college. And later in life, reflecting back, I realized one, one of the reasons at that, you know, once again, high school, starting colleges, those are, you know, teenage years and vulnerable times. So while part of it was, oh, you know, the sense of being different, but I like this cape, was it was actually me returning to that sense of a, a security blanket. When I was little, I didn't just have one. I outdid Linus. I had three, <laughs> uh, pink, yellow, and blue. <laughs> and as uh, as they said, I sucked them all <laughs> um, away. And, you know, it was, I was very at attached to them. And with the pandemic, I'm very much a mask wearer because I realized that also comes back to that, you know, protection aspect of the, the sense of cloth. Um, I wash my mask in those, like, you know, Dawn or scent beads, so they also have a soothing smell. So it becomes this, you know, once again, a soothing part of that process of, of navigating our, our world and also part of soothing that anxiety. So with the cape, as you can see, there's a bit of white. So the, the bottom layer is a white tight um, underlying, so that compression um, you know, it's kind of that anxiety, like if you read anything by Temple Grandin around the, the pressure um, from the, the you know, kind of sense of pressure. Uh, and actually one of the quiz shows in the UK, uh, eight out of 10 cats, one, once again, something that stood out in my head over the years is when the comedians talked about when he was feeling anxiety, he would wear a t-shirt too small because it felt like he was had a hug all day. <laughs> And so that also came to mind. And then the two layers is making this tangible physical representation of those colors, but representing, re recognizing like, it's not gonna be a linear process. I may be moving towards better or, you know, you know calming myself down, but that's not gonna you know, alleviate all the anxiety behind it. And then the breathing apparatus with the plastic bag on top is, as I was mentioning earlier, in meditation and in that mindful practice, the breath is, you know, key. And with the plastic bag, that gave me two things. One, um, it, it gave me that sense of pressure uh, when I was doing the, when I was breathing. Um, and then it gave me a sense of a rhythm or a pulse um, with the slight crinkle as it inflated and deflated, which gave me something to focus on. So then I could, wasn't getting distracted externally and could focus on my interior self. And as I'm working through my feelings and trying to identify them, I shift the two layers of the cape around um to you know be able to like kind of reflect what's going on and that's another part of it this being so big and and bright because mental health is something that's still you know while we're getting better about it it's still not something we talk about a whole lot it's not something i'm had typically been comfortable because my you know my self-defined persona is i'm stoic and i don't cry and you know, I can handle it. Well, um, I, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, in 2020, as I told people, I got really good at being vulnerable and crying on video <laughs> with a lot of people. Um, so this video here, this was a session, you know, as I started documenting these sessions, once I just got comfortable with performing or not performing, but utilizing um, the Cape, and this had been a really stressful day, um, had a meeting that made me really angry, and so this is, you know, halfway, or at this point in the process, I am getting calmer, so you can see I'm pulling the red pieces out, because it's like, well, I'm getting those ruminating thoughts that would usually just take up all my brain space, I'm getting those tampered down, but there's still this layer of anxiety and anger over what happened. So that hasn't fully gone away. So that's part of, of this process. And in the gallery, there's the full 
um, documentation from when I got up from my um, computer after the meeting and first try to walk it off and then uh, realizing, no, this is one that I need to, to use my tool. Um, so this, you know, like I was saying in my bio, like, you know, my pieces historically been more social based and uh, I hide behind other items. And here's the first time where it's like, it's me in the video, it's me like loudly communicating my emotions and what I'm going through and just kind of exposing all, all those aspects. So I, and yeah, I, I think Doris for this Wonder Woman residency, it truly has been a lifesaver during this year and the, all my artists I, for, that I worked with in this residency, it's like, this was such uh, a needed um, space. And I don't think I'd have the, the courage and the bravery to indulge in, in this piece. It does feel indulging to um, um, talk about my emotions and then also literally put myself out there. So thank you very much. Okay, so then I, next after me, we have uh, Sharon De La Cruz. She is a multidisciplinary artist and educator and activist from New York City. And her research and practice is rooted in the intersection of STEM. So if you don't know, STEM is uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics pedagogy, art, and social justice. Storytelling, which we'll get to, see, you're about to see this beautiful uh, new story comic that she's working on. However, uh, prior to this, uh, through the Tin House Summer Workshop, she created her first graphic novel memoir, I'm a Wild Seed, which I'm also a proud owner of. Um, so I highly recommend, if you have it, you get this. Um, it's a beautiful, engaging and, and just like, um, you know, a beautiful novel and just talk about someone being like, being a, 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 someone really showing how to be vulnerable in your art, just inspirational. So Sharon, I just love it. Um, the, let's see, the uh, Kirk's, Curtis Reviews called the work a potent graphic mem memoir. Uh, about forming one woman's queer identity that effectively portrays both the fears and joys of discovering one's marginalized identity. And Publishers Weekly uh, wrote that the wit and exuberance found here marks her as a worthy new author in her limber, playful debut collection. So once again, I highly recommend go to your independent bookstore <laughs> and get it. Um, but is also available on Amazon if it's more convenient, uh, convenient for you. Uh, De La Cruz received her master's from NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program, represent, and is a recipient of the Full Sight, uh, Full Sight, uh, Fulbright Fellowship, Processing Foundation Fellowship, and a TED residency. And she's currently the 2122 Red Burns Teaching Fellow at ITP NYU. And if that wasn't enough, she's currently serves as Director of Sustainability at the Point CDC, a nonprofit dedicated to youth development and the culture and economic re revitalization of the Humps Point section of the Bronx. So as you can see, she's lazy and doesn't do anything. <laughs> she's like most prolific, amazing person. So I'm so excited. So Sharon, I was so excited to learn about the itchies. Thank you so much. Note to self, I'm just gonna like, cut the bio into like three sentences next time. <laughs> but thank you so much, Polly. Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here and spending your Friday evening with us. This is like super beautiful and a blessing. Um, my name is Sharon De La Cruz. I'm a multidisciplinary artist and activist from New York City. And I'll be talking about my mini comic, The Ichis, next. Comics is where I find joy and is an art form that I, that tends, uh, that suits me well because of my sense of humor. <laughs> um, because of its structure, comics encourages us to think beyond the literal and help make uh, complicated ideas more digestible. Next. So when I had an itch to scratch, literally, with the healthcare system, I made a comic about it. 
next. There was a lot of bleeding today. You definitely had gingivitis, but I'm not surprised. Your people usually have that. And it was literally what was said to me <laughs> in one of my visits. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had the best experience with doctors. It's always felt as if something was missing or rather that I was missing something. Why is the system so racist? No, that I said system, not the individual doctors necessarily. Next. But before I dive into the e -chains, I wanna give you a little bit more context. I love to learn about history because I believe that the residuals of the past form our current experiences. So these are three of, um, three of the things that like influenced this comic, um, which includes this stellar storytelling from the podcast um, through line. It's an NPR podcast, if you don't know about it. It is amazing and it digs into uh, different topics, uh, different history topics. The next one is the dense, but literally the most beautiful book called Medical Apartheid, um, which exposes and archives um, the bluntly racist U.S. medical healthcare system, beginning with enslaved Africa, when, beginning when enslaved Africans touched U.S. Uh, soil to the present. Um, and then, lastly. Uh, graphic novels obviously are my influence as well, such as the story of my tits, <laughs> which uses humor and comics to talk about the author's long battle with breast cancer. Um, and so next I'll talk about, well, actually I'll read an excerpt of the Ichis. Next. I ignored the sensation, figuring it was just another flare up. Babe, fuck. Babe. You need to see a dermatologist. You got the itchings. Next. Good morning. My name is Dr. Chen. Super casual horse blinders. I wasn't sweating this doctor's visit. No room for racist or classist comments here. Just a topical allergy test and I would be cured in no time. Next. Dr. Chen took a biopsy of my skin and rec recommended a steroid cream. That left my face with discolored patches of skin so drastic, I avoided public gatherings for weeks. And this is pre-COVID. <laughs> next. My dermatology visit included, my next dermatology visit included negative biopsy results, hooray, and a week-long topical allergy exam. This resulted in an unexpected bond with my dog. Next. On my third visit, things began to get a little weird. Based on your test, you're highly allergic to nickel. Better make sure that necklace is real. Is she smirking? Next. She thinks you're too poor to afford a real necklace. Tell her her eyeliner makes her look like a raccoon. You're being sensitive because your mother gifted you that necklace. Relax. Next. Sure, looks like the cream worked. Well, actually the steroid really messed me up. Instead, I used an organic facial oil. Did your mom make it? Next. She's talking about your mama again. Tell her she looks like a rat poon. Oh boy, look how sweet. She's inquiring whether this was a homemade remedy. Next. Nope. Got it online. It's called the Chiso Facial Serum. Found it. It's all natural. I guess steroids do have several side effects. Next. No shit, Sherlock. Next. Although Dr. Chen wasn't my ideal doctor, I knew I could establish a healthy pushback relationship with her. Plus, she had access to tests and labs I needed. I would risk exposing myself to microaggressions in turn for some relief against the Ichis. Nothing seemed to keep them away for too long. Oh, ah, no. Next. Next. I think, oh. I think one more back maybe, oh. Sorry, next, there you go. <laughs> huh? The shape of your Ichis kind of look like your art project. Oh my God, I think you're right. Next. 
My art project was a leotard with a circuit I attached to the front of it. Scratch, scratch. Based on your test, you're highly allergic to nickel. Better make sure that necklace is real. I stitched on lights with conductive thread and powered it with a lithium battery. Testing the circuit included running current through the leotard while I wore it. What I didn't realize is that without a protective barrier, I wasn't just testing the circuit, I was testing my skin. Next. Without a protective barrier between my skin and the circuit, I was con consistently exposing myself to nickel and other harmful metals. Is this heavy metal poisoning? Next. The potential of heavy metal poisoning was, was scary. However, I felt relief knowing what could be happening. Let's look up which herbs can help your liver push those metals out. Next. I see it almost there in the next slide. <laughs> And it's not quite making it. Ah, and you're just gonna have to buy the ichis in order to figure out what happened <laughs> next. Um, and that's available on my website. Um, and basically, uh, without giving too much away, I've learned, especially during the pandemic, that there's a balance between trusting your gut, allowing the experts to do their job, knowing the history and just generally being informed. Next. And thank you, thank you for everyone, you know, for everyone <laughs> that's here. And especially thank you for this residency, um, for giving me the space to think through something that was hard to communicate um, just verbally and, and creating a, the space for me to visually like explore what it means to make a medical comment. So thank you. And then next, there's a Q&A. So any questions for Polly and I? We'll take those in the chat. I love your voiceover uh, reading us the comic. It's so <laughs> good. It makes it that much better. Just want to say. Thank you. Oh, I'll ask Sharon. So the yeah, we've all talked about the the points of vulnerability and yours overarching because you're you're talking about your body overall but in putting together this comic was there a certain point that was this particularly vulnerable or that you really struggled with how to address or communicate yeah i think i was trying to strike a balance personally for me and not trying to and basically to, it's telling my truth of how how I personally balance like Western and Eastern medicine and, and when I um, when I feel it necessary to to dig into both right and and by honoring both so I felt like with this comic I was trying to be very careful to honor both right and and think through how I personally use different types of medicines in my life um, preventative and non-preventative. So I think that was um, that was what I was trying to communicate the most, but also what made me the most vulnerable <laughs> or what I was afraid of the most, right? Like I didn't want to feel like I was swaying one way more than the other. But I think you said it best um, as well, Polly, where it's, you know, making sure that we communicate how we're not experiencing, we don't experience just in the binary, right? And um, that we experience all sorts of emotions and we care and tend in all sorts of ways that are not binary. So I was hoping to really clearly drive that home with this comic. And that taking my power back also meant that I had to not only just communicate, but collaborate. <laughs> Even if my collaborators didn't know I was collaborating with them, <laughs> but it was like an intentional collaboration with doctors to figure this out because I could not, and I knew this, I could not figure it out by myself. Literally, I just did not have the means to those tests, those labs, and nor the doctor, right? Like the degree <laughs> to actually know what was happening with me. So it was, a, it was definitely a collaboration. 
Yeah, and, and I one of the things that really um, stood out for me was where you're talking about, okay, I'm willing to endure the, the microaggressions to get the help I need. And, um, you know, and I, you know, I'm thinking, you know, as a, a white female, I have an, a, enough, yeah, I have the challenges to face, but then once you get into other cultures and things right. of that nature, like you've been expressing, it's a, like, it's not just a step down, it's just a whole another, for you, like, what are you hoping in the future that you're able, you know, with, with, if we could magically make healthcare changes, you know, what, what are you help, hopeful that your future interactions could be? Hmm. Um, and I think my partner and I forced our general physician <laughs> to act this way where we're having conversations, um, where we're having conversations and we're um, blunt about that this is the first opinion and may not be the opinion we go with, but our doctor, at least our general physician, really works with us to, to not just explain, because I think there's a, you know, there's a difference between just like explaining something to someone, but, but believing them <laughs> and believing that they have lived in this body for X amount of years and might know a thing or two. So I, I hope that in the, dis I'm hoping that in the future, um, we can actually have conversations where, where there's again, striking, not, I don't know if it's a balance, but living in the non-binary <laughs> around our bodies and, and how we care for them. And honoring both experiences, I think is, is important. Yeah, because with, I like, because one of the things I think about with this presentation with Doris and yours kind of bookending, because you know, Doris, you're talking about how health field is very male centric. And then you taking it to like our current day. And you know, this was back last century. I had a colleague who went for a breast biopsy where they stuck a pin in her breast and then she had to get dressed and drive across town to you know get the x-ray and the biopsy. And I'm like, if that was a man in his testicle, there's no way they'd be jamming a needle in and go, all right, put your pants on and drive across town. I always said they'd have that on a pillow, you know, <laughs> carrying it through. And so I think that is, you know, something they're all both pulling out is, you know, we think how far we've come, but then there's certain aspects where while there's more women and and all in the health field, we still have a long way to go um, for that empathy around um, our processes. Doris has a question for you, Carly. Yeah. So how do I see this fitting in my larger body of work? Um, and does it create a space to think about product? Um, I see it actually um, opening and changing the direction of my work. Um, so I didn't really go into like the previous um, iterations before I got to the, the Kate that I saw. I originally started with a lot of my normal um, things of like, you know, I was pulling from tarot cards or badges, like hiding behind symbols. So for me, I think this opens me up from uh, hiding behind kind of the social justice or issues of the day. And, and th they've been very much more analytical and not really putting my voice in it or putting myself forward. So I see that kind of really changing where I go. Um, at this point, not really thinking about product because right now it's such a personal thing for me. Um, so it is a bit like this is my this is my toy <laughs> for me <laughs> um, because that's another, my other issue. Of uh, <laughs> actually, I just had my performance review at work today, and one of the feedback was like, "You don't have to be everyone's savior," <laughs> and that's my pro one of my problems. I want to help. I want to. Uh, I, uh, I want to ignore my problems and help everyone else. Um, so I think another change is, is focusing on me. Um, but oh, okay, I hadn't thought about that. That is a good point about the kids, um, you know, coming up with a way for them to process mm -hmm. emotions. Um, because, you know, I think one of the things that's always, especially the, the younger kids, like elementary age, is what is the impact that's on them when they hear someone at their school has COVID, so now they have to quarantine. And 
and even you know we already have enough emotion you know dealing with emotions beyond that but particularly in the the new world that we live in so that's a very good point i hadn't thought about that <laughs> yeah i have friends that say if men could get pregnant you'd have drive-through abortions <laughs> <laughs> and a birth control would be, you know, just like with um, erectile dysfunction medicine, that would be covered insurance and all that. So yeah, I agree. <laughs> all Any other questions? Uh, and the, the Mary J's in my opening story is the Mary J's, but also was, I was fortunate to work with in this residency. And um, you know, she's not presenting her work tonight, but definitely go to the gallery. I, I know they're gonna cover um, all the things that are wonderful things happening this weekend at, NG, at the university, but um, definitely go check out everyone else's work. And hers is really fascinating around uh, labyrinths and journeys and, and nature and how that connects. Yeah, Helen, yeah, I uh, have been, um, someone put to us about therapy. Yeah, I've been one of those kind of, I've tried it before, but it been in and out. And the one nice thing with Oh Mine is it's easier if you don't have a connection with someone to try someone else. Um, so I would say if you've done, tried it in the past or something of that nature and it didn't resonate, try again. My, the first therapist I connected with early or like in my late 20s it was because she had a rocking chair <laughs> and that then like uh and that proved and then this one that i found after three or four tries like you know the mindfulness and all aligned uh and i'll put the link in to the group i it's called pause and expand and they have free sessions mondays 8 30 and wednesdays 8 30 uh, mondays are kickoffs which has come once again, talk about boundaries for the first time with work. I don't allow any meetings to get booked on Mondays and Wednesdays between 8.30 and 9. Because um, it really, the Monday really helps set the intention for the week. And then the Wednesday is a meditation. They both do sound baths, which if you haven't done a sound bath, but it's these auditory experiences. Um, in fact, since it's the beginning of a new month, we have the purification, which is to help you know, let go of all the uh, negative of this past month and then look towards the uh, new month. And so I know on some level that can sound foo-foo, but it really is. I, I'm t someone who tends to go negative mentally. <laughs> I always call myself worst case near Rwanda. Uh, so it's been really helpful in me catching those thoughts and finally, you know, after knowing that intellectually, actually being able to put that in practice. So check it out. Yeah. Doris also had a question for me. How do you see this kind of media-based storytelling fitting in the gallery? And also, do you see books or zines being a challenge for the gallery because of the expectation and how you think about the interaction of future ways to do it? Yes. I was so um, fixated at in making something tangible and specifically a, a book because I love <laughs> books and I um, that when I placed it in the gallery, I was like, who's going to sit here and read this? <laughs> um, and some people did, which was great, but the expectation to have to sit there was, you know, something that I really feel like I could think through differently. Um, so, so yes, there is a, there are the folks that did sit there and I appreciate, appreciate you all, but I'm wondering if there was even a way to experience the Ichis outside of um, the zine and then the zine tell that tell that story. Um, so I am thinking about, thank you, Amy. <laughs> um, I am thinking about how to present those comics in, in other ways. And there's some, some more questions. It, uh, your comics are personal. Do you find people connect with you and feel empowered to share their stories? Yes. Um, specifically also with Wild Seed, it was really interesting who wanted, you know, who wanted to talk about it and why they wanted to talk about it. 
Um, and I had I gotten a lot of women my age, BIPOC women and, and older who have told me that this is the first time they've seen themselves um, and, and seen, seen their like intersectional stories as queer BIPOC folks. And that's like really humbling and, you know, and equally as like ridiculous, you know, so I, <laughs> I continue to share stories because of, because of that. And then uh, Sharon is the future digital, is the future digital animation. If so, are you producing your own animated storytelling program? Oh man, I don't know if I have the patience for animation, but as a, as a child, I did tell my mom I was gonna be a cartoonist, which not far from now, um, and obsessed with, with animation. And yes, I did see that call for papers, Mary, and I'm, I'm gonna put in HE. But this is the first graphic medicine, what would be considered graphic medicine um, comic. And I thought that was interesting for me, <laughs> just because I'm not, that's not like thematically that, I don't think that's usually where, where I go or where I would have considered my autobiographical comics to land. Um, but it's so interesting because the, um, the story of my tits, that book was a game changer for me, especially to understand my mom's um, my mom's experience with breast cancer because it was so similar, and and I actually understood what my uh, scientifically and also you know uh, more emotionally what my mom was going through, and so I was really grateful for those types of storytelling. Oh yeah, I can also link to the overall shop to that now. We've got about a minute left for questions. So if anyone else has any questions, please put them in the chat now. Oh, uh, Avni asked, can you tell us about an upcoming project? I'm gonna give you just a sneaky peek <laughs> of this next project, which is a, it's gonna be following two people who I love and are basically giants in, in my world, um, Asada Shakur and my father, my stepfather, um, and it's gonna be following basically two black people in the diaspora who are in search of freedom in the opposite country. And so that is what I'm working on next, which is kind of wild because I have only written about myself really. <laughs> so this is uh, super, super pumped to talk about freedom. I also realized that I am obsessed with freedom um, and people's notions of, of freedom. So here we are trying to figure it out. But you know, that is, a, it's a lot more complicated, obviously, because of these two figures and their fragile state of being. Thank you so much, Sharon. Shouts. And thank you for everyone. Yeah, this is great. I mean, honestly, to be in a lineup with Doris, with Bali is like blessings. So yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna second those blessings. This felt like a treat, and I hope everyone else uh, felt some of that uh, sweet sweetness as well, some of that nourishment <laughs> yes. that we were trying to give out. Um, I think we'll conclude then. <laughs> All the hearts, all the hearts. Thank you, Polly. Thank you, Christine and Sharon. Uh, and uh, I hope that everyone who attended gets a chance to see the show if you're local and uh, you know, reach out to us if you would like to connect or have any other questions, please go ahead and do so. And thank you, Doris and Stephanie and Anna. Okay.
Yeah. Oh, you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Doris. You are all amazing. Doris, Christine, Polly, Sharon. We're just uplifted. You're teaching us how to be vulnerable. Um, really is something I think that that we all have to learn um, because it's like the the society <laughs> pushes back and we have to bo buoy each other up to uh, you know it's a little smashed and open up again. So thank you so much. Um, again, come to see this these amazing exhibits through December 10th. Um, in the Visual Arts Gallery. Um, there'll be a closing reception on Thursday. And this Saturday and Sunday, and also um, Surface Tension is an, a solo exhibit running in the Lemmerman Gallery um, in Hepburn Hall. And this weekend, both galleries are open uh, as part of the NJCU Winter Jazz Fest. So come spend you know, your whole weekend here, hear some amazing music and amazing art and just go back and forth between the galleries and the Margaret Williams Theater. Um, we will just welcome you. Uh, njcu.edu slash arts. You can get tickets. Um, the exhibitions are free. And um, upcoming arts programs, we have a whole second semester of programming that we hope you'll join us for. We have some more music to round out this December also, um, pop R&B and uh, opera. So keep joining us. This is your home to, for, for nourishment. And I, I hope that you have a wonderful evening. Doris, would you like to give some closing words? No, have a great weekend, be safe and talk about your health. Don't be shy, find, find your people and you know, process, find your people and process it. It's a lot, it's a lot right now. It's a, a lot extra right now. So sending, sending some, some energies and some everyone who might be struggling. Good luck and be well.